Good afternoon, students. It's afternoon for me. I literally finished um, teaching an AP Readiness class for the UC Riverside cohort about 35 minutes ago, so I'm just kind of tired. Can you see the dead eyes? <laughs> um, and I'm having a hot cup of tea on 90 degree weather today because um, my speaking voice is pretty tired right now. But hopefully I'll be okay um, in this video. I'm kind of zoned in, I'm like locked in, I'm all things biology right now, so hopefully it'll go okay. Okay, so in this video, I'm gonna talk about our diffusion osmosis lab that we did in class. And I think what I'll do is I will upload the document, the lab document in my Google Drive, and I'll link it in the comments below or in the info box below, okay? <clears throat> Wow, my voice is super tired, but it's okay. I'm locked in. All right, um, so AP Biology, Diffusion, and Osmosis Lab. So we did three days of the Diffusion Osmosis Lab. There were three parts. So part one was calculating surface area and volume of three different size cells, a small one, a medium, and a large. And then part two, observing osmosis in living cells, specifically potato cells, and then modeling diffusion and osmosis using um, dialysis tubing, okay? Okay, so for part one, what we did was I made um, some agar, which is a type of sugar from seaweed, it's like a seaweed sugar, and it was dyed pink. And how I did that was I mixed the agar with phenylphthalein, phenylphthalein, I think that's how you say it, with NaOH. And so NaOH is a base and phenylphthalein is an indicator. It turns pink in the presence of, an, of a base, okay, a basic solution. So what you guys did was you cut out three different size cubes, uh, small, medium, large, and then you submerge them in some vinegar, which is acidic. And so what happens is that the, the vinegar it diffuses into the agar and it changes the agar from uh, pink to clear, okay? So you observe diffusion taking place as cubes turn clear in the acid. And then you measure the percent of diffusion for all three cubes. And this is just a screenshot from our worksheet, okay? And in table, <clears throat> let me use a different color. Um, and in table 1.2, you basically measure the distance that uh, it diffused, the acid diffused into the pink agar cube and you wrote down the distance. So you just took your ruler and you measured that. And from that, um, you this first column, you measure the total volume of the cube and you write that there, that includes the clear. And then you measure the volume of just the pink cube. And you can figure that out by subtra subtracting the distance. So each side now of the cube is, you know, compared to this side, of the first cube, the entire clear cube versus the pink cube. The pink cube is much smaller now, right? So you measure the side and then that's how you figure out the volume of the pink agar. And then, <clears throat> and then you subtract the pink from the entire volume to get the clear agar volume, okay? So you take this value and then you subtract this from it to give you this value. And then you take the clear agar, so this value, and you divide it by this column, the total volume, to give you percent diffusion, okay? So you take this value and you divide it by this value to give you, um, and then multiply it by 100% to get percent diffusion. And then to figure out the rate of diffusion, which is percent divided by the minutes, which was five minutes, you take this value divided by five minutes, okay? And then on the next page, you're supposed to graph it. Um, actually, I kind of say here, like draw the best fit line, but it could be a bar graph technically because we're dealing with three different kinds of cubes, okay? It could be a line graph or a bar graph. Line graph because it is a measurement of <clears throat> diffusion um, over time um, with the different sizes of cubes or it could just be a bar graph. It, I don't think it really matters, okay? So um, the x-axis is going to be the surface area to volume ratio, right? The smallest cell is going to have the largest surface volume 
to surface area to volume ratio. So remember we talked about how small cells have a larger surface area to volume ratio versus big cells have a smaller surface area to volume ratio. So your big, your big cube is going to be um, somewhere over here on the graph, and then the medium cube somewhere over here, and then the small cube over here, okay? And you should see just a slight um, line or bar graph in height, increasing in height, uh, going in this direction. The trend should be like this because the percent diffusion should be a lot more in a small cell than in a big cell, okay? Because the acid should have diffused uh, through most of the small cell when compared to the big cell. So, you know, what does this have to do with living things, right? Remember we talked about how living things have to be small. Cells have to be small in order to meet the needs of the cell, okay? A small cell is going to have a large surface area to volume ratio. So let's say that one side of this small cell, which is a cube shape, um, it's one centimeter. If you figure out the surface area, it's gonna be six centimeter uh, square for volume it's going to be one centimeter cube and you take this value divided by the volume and you get six but if you have a larger cell which is five centimeters it's going to be 150 centimeter square surface area divided by the volume which is 125 centimeter cube and you get 1.2 so the volume surface area to volume ratio is is a lot smaller in a bigger cell it's going to be bigger in a smaller cell. That's kind of confusing, okay? But basically, okay, in a small cell, you have a lot of surface area to feed the volume of the cell. So when food goes into the small cell, it gets absorbed and feeds the entire volume of the cell because it's relatively small compared to the surface area. It's gonna uh, feed the cell a lot faster than if it was a bigger cell. A bigger cell, when food enters and waste is going to leave, it takes a lot more time because there's a lot more volume. The surface area to volume ratio is a lot smaller, okay? It's going to take a lot longer. So cells are small because in order to meet the needs of the cell, it has to be able to quickly uh, feed the volume of the cell. Food has to come in and quickly feed the volume of the cell, or the cell has to get rid of waste quickly, okay? And so that's why, you know, organisms are made up of a lot of tiny, tiny cells rather than one big cell or many big cells. Part two was observing osmosis in living cells. So before you guys actually did the experiment, um, I made six different sucrose solutions. I just mixed regular table sugar in water um, and the most hypertonic solution would be the 1.0 molar sucrose solution, very hypertonic, very sweet. If you were to taste it, it would be very sweet. And then I kind of added a little bit more water, kind of diluted it down to 0.8 molar, which is also hypertonic, okay? Compared to no sugar in water, this one on the far right side is just pure water. It's zero molarity sucrose. And then you have 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. And one. So I basically made up six different solutions, okay? And I didn't tell you which solution is which, but you were supposed to figure it out based on how much mass the potato cores gained or how much mass the potato cores lost. So um, I made six different sucrose solutions, but I, t I didn't tell you which color solution is which sucrose solution. Okay, so like which one is red? The point is it 1.0? Is it 0.4? Is the orange 0.8? Is it 0.2? So I didn't tell you, I just gave you six different colored solutions and you put potato pieces in there. Okay, so you cut out six pieces of potato or six potato cores. Um, actually, you before you put it in the solution, you, you put them on a scale and you mass them, right? And you recorded the mass. You waited 24 hours and then you mass them again. And depending on which solution the potato core was in, it either gained or lost um, uh, mass, okay? Based on your results, you're able to determine which colored solution correlated with which uh, sucrose solution. So going back to this picture, right? Um, if you put a cell, a potato cell, or potato core in here in a very hypertonic solution, that means that the potato itself is hypotonic, 
right? Because remember, we use hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic. We really use those vocabulary terms when we are comparing solutions to other solutions. So when we say that the 1.0 molar sucrose solution is hypertonic, then therefore the plant potato core is hypo hypotonic, okay? So the potato is going to be hypotonic. And remember, water, okay? Water is always going to flow from a hypotonic solution to a hyper. So remember how we said hypo has a greater water potential or has a greater water concentration, okay? Uh, it has a greater water potential. It has more water. Hypotonic solutions have more water than hyper. And like an arrowhead, the greater than sign looks a lot like an arrowhead. That shows you the direction in which water is going to flow. Okay, Water is going to go from hypo to hyper. So if the potato cores are hypo, then the water is going to be removed from them and the water is going to go out into the sucrose solution. What's going to happen to the potato cores? They're going to lose mass. They lose water weight. Okay, they lose water weight, they lose mass. Okay, so um, you didn't know that this solution was 1.0, but from your data, 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 from your data, um, you should know, you should have figured out that that colored solution, and it was the yellow one, the yellow one was the 1.0 molar sucrose solution because the potato core lost the most mass. And I believe we saw that in most of the groups, maybe there were one or two groups that didn't have that result, but 1.0 molar sucrose solution is um, the solution where the potato gained the most mass versus, let's go on this side, pure water, okay? If we have zero, per, zero molar concentration, meaning it's just pure water, and you put a potato in there, that means it's hypo out here and it's hyper inside. And water is going to go from hypo to a hypertonic solution. That means water goes into the potato cores. Water goes into the potato cores. As a result, the potato core will gain the most mass in uh, a 0%. Okay? Same here. Uh, 0.2 is also um, hypotonic to the potato core. So you'll see a little bit of change in the mass. You should see um, <clears throat> potato core gain a little bit of mass, okay? Remember the two extremes, hypertonic, the two extremes, hypotonic, you're gonna see the most change, most gain in mass in zero, the most loss in mass in one, and then all the other ones kind of in between. So 0.8, the potato core will lose mass, but not as much as 1.0, um, and then 0.6 will lose mass, but not as much as 0.8 and 1.0, and also 0.4, we did see a little bit of loss in mass, okay? So then what I wanted you guys to do is going to our, this is another screenshot, was to figure out the concentration, the molarity of the solution. And this is what we came together. In class, we figured this out together, right? Yellow was 1.0 um, molar because when we calculated the percent change in mass, it had the biggest um, decrease. It was a negative number. Okay, and how do you figure out this? Um, I, I wrote it on the board in class, but um, I'll write it here. Okay, it is final, the final minus initial. And this is an equation that you should be familiar with because you're going to be using this all year long and possibly on the AP exam. And I know. Um, on the AP exam, they did, they have asked students, how do you calculate percent change in mass in an FRQ question, okay? Divided by the initial, and then you're going to multiply by percent, 100 percent, to figure out percent change in mass. Final minus initial divided by initial. So the yellow solution, which was the most hypertonic, lost the most mass. So it's final minus initial, and that's why it's a negative number because the initial weight was greater than the final, mass was greater, that's why you're gonna end up with a negative number. And I don't know, I'm just gonna write negative 38. I just made that up, okay? But I do know that in class it was around there. And then um, the blue solution was 0.8, maybe that was like negative 31, I'm making this up. And then maybe the next one was negative 24, and then negative, uh, I don't know, 10. 
And then this one, you should have gained the most mass. And I don't remember, but I think it was maybe like 27. Okay. And then this one would have been like 10. So um, yeah, the water one, the orange one gained the most mass because it's the most hypotonic. And yellow lost the most mass because it's the most hypertonic. So just from your data, you should be able to figure out um, what solution is which, uh, which uh, sucrose solution is which color solution, okay? And then I ask you to graph this. Title would just be percent change in mass. Sorry about my messy writing. Uh, potato cores, okay? Um, so maybe let's just like go up to 40 and 40. So let's do like, so we've got 5, 10, 15, ooh, 20, 25, 30. Okay, I guess we're only going up to 35. Okay, same here. Negatives. Okay, this is all negatives. Negative 5, negative 10, negative 15. Oops. Oh my goodness, Mishim. 30, something like that, okay? Um, and then sucrose similarity is gonna be on the x-axis. You can write it here, or you can write it down here. It really doesn't matter. Um, I'm gonna write it right here, okay? One, two, three, four. So let's do the point two here, molarity. One, two, three, four. Point four. One, two, three, four. Point six. One, two, three, four. Point six. One, two, one, two, three, four. Point eight. One, two, three, four. Perfect. A 1.0 molarity. Okay. And when you graph it, remember in zero molarity, it's pure water. It gained the most mass. So like uh, you'll plot your points. Like I'm just going to make this up, but you need to plot your points um, correctly. Okay. But I'm just going to go like this. And then point four, there was a little bit of loss, right? And then point six, point eight. Okay. Um, so you're going to draw a line. Okay, you're gonna draw a line. Uh, it should be like a best fit line, as straight as you can, okay? So something like that. Um, everyone's answer to this question is gonna be a little bit different because the answer to this question, what is the molar concentration of the potato cell? It really depends on how you drew the line, how you drew the line. Where does it cross the X axis is the answer to this question. So where I drew my line, so if this is, uh, point three, right? If this is point three, then that means where I drew this, it looks like it's like point three seven. So I'm going to write that down, point three seven. Uh, what does that mean? What does that mean? Um, that just means that at point three seven, that is the solute concentration of the potato. That's the isotonic point. That's going to be isotonic to my potato cell because it hasn't gained any mass. It hasn't lost any mass at 0.37. At 0.37 solute concentration, my potatoes haven't gained or lost any mass. That's where it crossed the x-axis. That's the zero point, okay? Anything, anything um, higher in molarity, like 0 0.3, 0 0.2, I'm sorry, lower in molarity, like 0 0.3, 0 0.2, and zero, it's going to gain mass. Anything higher in molarity than 0 0.37, it's going to, it's going to lose mass. Okay. So I hope that makes sense. So this is my molar concentration of the potato cell at where it crosses the, the, um, X axis. And when we go over the practice problems, uh, with the zucchini cells, you have to know that. Okay. Uh, and also our FRQ, I'm going to definitely put a question like that on the FRQ. Okay, part three, the last part of the uh, lab was modeling diffusion and osmosis. You put six different sucrose solutions in dialysis tubes and put them, put them in, I apologize, I should say, in distilled water for 30 minutes. So remember the red color was 0.6 molar uh, sucrose. The orange was just pure water and then the yellow dialysis tubing, the tubing contained the yellow sucrose solution, which was one point molar. And then the green solution was 0.4. And then uh, 0.8 was um, the blue one. And then 0.2 was the purple one. Okay. You put all of those different sucrose solution in these dialysis tubes, but then you put all of them in cups of water. 
okay? And obviously, the water on the outside is going to be hypotonic. And then all of the bags are going to be hypertonic in comparison, right? It's hypo outside, hypo outside, meaning it's hyper inside, hypo. Oh my goodness, my writing, hypo, hypo, hyper inside, okay? So obviously water is going to go into all the bags, but which dialysis bag is going to have the most gain in water? The one that's most hypertonic, right? So the yellow bag should have gained the most mass because there's a greater concentration gradient. There's a greater concentration gradient, okay? It's so hypertonic in here compared to the outside, there's going to be a faster, okay, more osmosis is going to happen in this beaker because there's a higher concentration gradient. Compared to the uh, inside, the water potential is much greater on the outside compared to the inside. So water is going to flow in. So you should have seen the most gain in the yellow bag, okay, in the 1.0 molar sucrose solution. And then uh, blue, you should have seen the second highest gain in mass because it's 0.8. And then you should have seen the third highest gain in mass in the red. And then, uh, and then the green, and then the purple, and then um, I know some of you guys saw a little bit of loss even, you know. Um, it's supposed to, oh, I, didn't, I shouldn't have wrote hypo here. This is going to be iso and iso, right? So there's an equal amount of water going in and out. So if you guys got like negative numbers or positive numbers, that's okay. With experiments, there's always going to be a little bit of like, uh, user error, okay? Perhaps, you know, if it gained mass, maybe there was some water on the scale, or maybe if it lost mass, maybe there was a leak in the bag. There really could be any reason why um, the the uh, dialysis bag containing the orange solution, which was water, which is isotonic to the water outside, you know, there could be any reasons why there was a gain or or loss in mass, but it should be relatively small. The difference should be very, very small. And so, um, yeah, and then you're going to figure out the percent change in mass again by, it's going to be final minus initial um, divided by, oh my goodness, divided by initial. And because they're all gaining mass, it should, for the most part, it should all be positive numbers, okay? You may, um, you may not see positive number in the orange bag, orange one because it's isotonic okay that's okay all right and then you're gonna graph this all right and um, uh, it's gonna be percent change in mass of dialysis tubes okay the y-axis is gonna be the change percent change in mass okay and then the molar concentration is gonna be on the bottom okay so um, yeah with the line, right, should be going something, it should look like this, right? Because as you increase in uh, molar concentration from zero, you should barely see any difference. Um, to one, you should see the greatest increase in mass because it, the, the yellow one had the most hypertonic solution, okay? Anyway, so I hope that explained part three because I think students were kind of confused with part three versus part two. All right, now to the last couple of pages on the lab packet. Let me just have a drink of my tea. Okay, explain the relationship between the change in mass and the molarity of sucrose within the dialysis bag. I kind of went over that when I went over the graph, right? Um, the more hypertonic a solution is, Okay, there's a higher concentration gradient, so water is going to move into the bag. My goodness, and the 1.0 molar sucrose solution, because it's so hypertonic, because there's a higher concentration gradient, it's going to gain the most mass. Okay, it's going to gain the most mass. Water is going to go into the bag, and it's going to gain the most mass. Whereas, like comparing it to 
the purple solution, which was 0.2, it's, there's not a huge concentration gradient. There is a concentration gradient, but it's not as much as 1.0. So there is going to be some gain in mass. Some water is going to go in, but not as much as the 1.0 and, and hypotonic water on the outside. Okay. So the greater the concentration gradient, the more hypertonic a solution is, the more water is going to flow in by osmosis and the more mass it's going to gain. Um, predict what would happen to the mass of each bag in this experiment if all the bags are placed in 0.4 molar sucrose solution instead of distilled water. So instead of putting all of those bags in pure water, it's put in um, 0.4. Okay, so let me erase all the ink on this slide. So instead of being Oh, whoa. Instead of being uh, water, I'm just going to write down that it's 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.4. So for this question, you're supposed to predict what happens. You guys, if it's 0 0.6 out here and 0 0.4 on the outside, which is hypotonic, which is hypertonic? Hopefully you guys are saying this is hypo less solute it's a smaller number smaller molarity this is hyper on the inside so water is going to go inside but is there a huge concentration gradient no there is not a huge concentration gradient the water will go inside but the bag itself is not going to gain that much mass okay um over here what's going to happen to this bag of water this bag of water it's going to it's hypotonic inside, right? So water is going to exit. It's going to lose mass. Okay, and then this one on the inside, it's very hypertonic. And so water is going to go inside. It's going to gain mass. And then this is 0.4 on the inside. So it's isotonic to the 0.4 molarity on the outside. So the bag really shouldn't gain or lose any mass. There's an equal amount of water going in and out. The blue liquid in this dialysis bag, it's hypertonic, right, 0.8. It's hypotonic inside. Um, there is quite a difference, and so water is going to go in, and it should gain relatively um, a large amount or a medium-sized amount of mass, okay? And then the purple was 0.2. There is this very small, a very small concentration gradient or difference in concentration. It's hypotonic inside. It's hypertonic outside. So water is going to exit the bag, go into the liquid, the solution, the beaker. So our bag for purple, it's going to lose mass. It's going to lose a little bit of mass, lose a little bit of mass because it's 0.2 on the inside. It's hypotonic compared to the 0.4 on the outside. But there's not a huge difference, right? 0.2 versus 0.4. It's not a huge concentration gradient. So a little bit of water will be lost. It will lose a little bit of mass. So then you're going to state all of that here uh, in this table. Okay, now let's move on to the last page of our worksheet. Fill in the blanks with the words provided. So water moves from a, across a cell membrane from hypotonic solution to the hypertonic solution, right? Remember this? Hypo has more water has greater water than hyper. And so therefore, water is going to go in this direction. OK? Um, you guys, we're just talking about water. We're not talking about solutes, because solutes, if they can fit through a semi-permeable membrane, they are going to go from a high concentration to a lower concentration. OK, but that's, that's diffusion. That's something related, but different. But we're just talking about water right now. We're just talking about water. Water moves across the cell membrane from a solution with high water potential to a solution with low water potential. So anything that's hypotonic compared to hyper has a higher, has a higher water potential. Okay, remember this is the symbol for water potential, high water potential versus low water potential. Think of it this way. When we say water potential, it's the potential for water to move. It's the potential for water to move. If it's high, it has a lot of potential for water to move. A hypotonic solution has a higher potential for the water to move from it. Okay. Consider what would happen to red blood cell placed in distilled water. 
So we're talking a very hypotonic solution. Um, so the red blood cell, okay, RBC, oops, RBC, uh, and it's going to be in distilled water, very hypo. What can happen to it? Well, it can burst, right? It's going to fill up with water and it can lyse. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry, which would have the higher concentration of water molecules? Um, outside, right? The outside, the distilled water, obviously, H2O. B, uh, which would have the higher water potential? Outside, the water. Uh, what would happen to the red blood cell? It, would, it could burst. Why? Because there's a high concentration gradient. Water will go from hypo to hyper, and water fills the cell, and the cell membrane can burst as the cell fills up with um, a lot of water. Okay, Unlike a plant cell, a plant cell has a cell wall that could protect it from bursting, but really our red blood cells, our cells, do not have a cell wall that can prevent lysing. Okay, um, this one is important to know. Okay, hint, hint. Uh, zucchini cores placed in sucrose solution at 27, I think that's supposed to be degrees, okay? Not that trademark sign. Uh, Celsius resulted in the following percent changes after 24 hours. So this is a lot like the lab that you guys did. Instead of potato, it's now zucchini, which is a different, uh, actually zucchini is a fruit and potatoes are a vegetable. Anyways, graph the results. What is the molar concentration of solutes within the zucchini cell? So you got to graph this first. Um, so this is 0, 1, and then this would be 1.0 over there. Okay, and then percent change. So we're going... Uh, 20 is the highest above and 30 is below. Hmm. Let's just do like 10s, okay? 10, 20. You guys, my eyesight is getting so bad. 20, 30. That might not be good enough, but it's okay. Oh my goodness, my eyesight is getting so bad. Okay, and then we got negative 10. Negative 20 negative 30, negative 40. Let's plot the data. Uh, at zero, it's an increase of 20%, so that's my data point right there. At point 0.2, I've got plus 10. At point 0.4, I've got negative 3. Oof, that's going to be a little bit weird. And then point 0.6, I've got minus 17, like right over here maybe and then point eight i've got negative 25 25 and then at one point oh which is all the way over here, there okay behind my head but let's just draw a straight line as straight as we can okay all right what is the molar concentration of solutes within the zucchini cells? What's like the solute concentration in the zucchini cell? Remember, just like the previous part of the lab, it's wherever the line crosses the x-axis. Axes. Axis? Axis. Okay. Point two. This is point three. It looks like it's crossing exactly around uh, point three five. Point three, five. So that's my answer for molar concentration of solutes within the zucchini cell. Percent change. Let's just label this uh, uh, graph. Percent change in mass for zucchini cells. Okay. Um, so what do you do with this information? Like um, you could you could calculate the water potential of zucchini. Here's the equation for water potential. Sorry, you guys. Water potential is equal to the solute potential plus the pressure potential. And you know, um, on any test where they don't give you the pressure potential, you can just assume that the pressure potential is zero. They have to give you the pressure potential if they, you know, if it's not zero, okay? And so the pressure potential is gonna be zero, especially if it's like, 
Um, we're talking about a solution that's in a beaker that is open in a classroom, in a room. The pressure potential is zero, okay? Because it's an open system and there's nothing being, there's no pressure being applied to it, okay? So we're gonna assume that the pressure potential is zero. Therefore, everybody, water potential is equal to solute potential. The next problem on the worksheet asks you to solve, um, calculate the solute potential. But let's do this super quick. What is the water potential of the zucchini cell? Well, water potential is equal to the solute potential and solute potential is equal to negative ICRT. Okay, so let me just go to the next slide really quick and then I come back to this. This is our equation, solute potential is equal to negative I CRT. What is I? I is the ionization constant. Whatever solute is being dissolved in water, if it forms multiple or more than one ion or molecule, then the ionization constant is gonna be greater than one. It's gonna be like two. For example, NaCl, salt. When salt is dissolved in water, its ionization constant is two because it dissolves into two ions, Na plus and Cl minus. Whereas sucrose, even though sucrose is a, it's a disaccharide, it's a sugar, it doesn't ever ionize, it stays together because all of the carbons and hydrogens and oxygens in sucrose are covalently bonded. They don't ionize, they're covalently bonded and um, they stay together. All the atoms stay together as one molecule. So sucrose, the ionization constant is one. Um, and then C stands for the molar concentration. R is always the same. It's a pressure constant. It's always gonna be 0 0.0831. And then the temperature, again, needs to be in Kelvin because that is the standard international unit for temperature. It's 273 plus um, whatever temperature it's given in Celsius. Okay, so going back to um, this and um, so, oh, I'm kind of running out of room, but so it's going to be negative one. What is the C? What's the concentration of the zucchini? Right over here. It's wherever it crossed the axis. 0. 0.35. Remember, C is the concentration. It says here, what is the molar concentration? Okay, you just got to plug in. Plug in. R is always the same. It's 0. 0.08. Three, one, and then running out of space, but the temperature, you multiply by the temperature, which in this case, it says it's 27 degrees, so it's gonna be 273 plus 27. Um, so in your on your calculator, I would definitely add the temperature first, so it's gonna be 100, okay, it's gonna be 300. So 300 degrees Kelvin. So you gotta multiply negative one times 0.35 times 0.831 times 300, okay? Um, so that's how you would figure out the solute potential of the zucchini cell, which is the water potential. That is the water potential of the zucchini cell. All right, let's do the next practice problem. <clears throat> Erase all. Um, oh my goodness, I'm, my voice is totally running out. I've been talking like nonstop since 9 a.m. and it's already two something. But again, I'm like locked into bio. Everything is bio for me right now. It's April 14, 1912, and your journey on the unsinkable ship, the Titanic, is coming to an end. Luckily, you were one of the few souls to gain a seat in the lifeboat as you watched the great ship tip up, then break in half and sink. Oh, man. Uh, you are hit with a feeling of being thirsty. I'm thirsty. What a, what a coincidence. In the rush to get to safety, no one thought to pack provisions into the lifeboat. Day after day, your party floats along the frigid Arctic air and your thirst begins to feel unquenchable. People are starting to panic and experimenting with drinking seawater to quench their thirst. You're not sure that this is a good idea, so you decide to solve a couple of water potential problems while waiting for rescue to determine if drinking seawater is a good idea or not. Hmm. Um, the majority of dissolved ions in seawater is NaCl, roughly 0.5 molar NaCl concentration. So automatically, guys, you should think, oh, they gave it, they gave us molar. And according to this um, uh, equation, molar is going to be the C, right? The C part of our equation. Calculate the solute potential for seawater if you note that the water is minus 5 degrees Celsius, okay? 
So you just got to plug in and for NaCl, it's going to be two. The ionization constant is going to be two. By the way, it doesn't say that here, but um, on the AP exam, like the booklet, they're going to provide for you a formula sheet and they will give you the ionization constant for um, whatever solution that they want you to, um, uh, that's relevant to the question, okay? So, and then the C is going to be 0.5, and then the R is going to be always 0 .8, 0 0.0831. Temperature, it's going to be 273 minus 5. Okay, so when you do this on your calculator, mathematically calculate it, that's the answer to this question, the solid potential. It's going to be negative 22.27. Okay, 22.27. Let me just double check my work. Okay, your own cells have a 0.15 molar NaCl concentration. Calculate the solute potential for your own cells knowing that body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's plug in um, negative 2 C15 R, which is always 0 0.0831, T, which is temperature, it's going to be 273 plus 37. Okay, and so when you do the math, calculate it, you get negative 7.7. .7. Okay, so negative 7.7 .7 would be the solute concentration or solute potential, I should say, solute potential of your own cells compared to seawater. Seawater is negative 22.27 compared to your cells, seven, negative 7.7. .7. So the last question is referencing both parts A and B. Explain which direction water will flow if a person drinks very cold seawater. Okay, so human cell negative oops negative 7.7 .7, whereas seawater outside is negative 22.27 uh, which has a higher water potential which has a higher water potential out your cells have a higher water potential it's hypotonic here and it's hypertonic outside um, because outside is a greater negative number Inside, it is a negative number, but it's not uh, it's not more negative than negative 22. So inside your cells is hypotonic. Outside, seawater is hypertonic. What's going to happen to somebody that drinks cold seawater? Water is going to flow out of their cells, and they're going to become more and more dehydrated. Okay? So explain which direction water will flow if a person drinks very cold seawater. Is drinking seawater a good idea for survival? No, right? You're going to become more and more dehydrated as water leaves. What effect will drinking seawater have on your ch on you and your chances of surviving until you're rescued? Yeah, it's it's going to greatly decrease your chances of survival. Greatly decrease your chances of survival, right? Because what's happening is that you are surround your cells are surrounded by hypertonic solution when you're drinking it, the seawater and water is going to uh, leave and your cells are going to shrivel up become dehydrated okay so you guys remember this diagram uh, in a hypotonic solution our cells could possibly burst isotonic it's at a normal state animal cells in a hypertonic solution will shrivel up okay okay so um that's what i wanted to go over for the lab packet and i hope that um this video helped you better understand our lab all three parts and that you're ready for our quiz on um frq on diffusion osmosis and yeah okay bye